Hey everybody and welcome to another week of Speakeasy Reviews and in my 40s I forgot the name of the show there for a very split second Andrew how you doing this week? <laughs> I'm doing well and other than the occasional senior moment that plagues me as well. <laughs> I so I just for everybody who's watching this this week as you've seen from the title you've probably clicked on it we are doing a versus uh the Superman the original theatrical version the Lester version versus what uh, Andrew you've made me aware is the Donner cut which has come out recently and this was new to me I had to spend quite a bit of time researching the the provenance of this film well speaking of old man you might want to define recently the Donner cut's now 15 years old but uh which uh, yeah but it was released not too long ago so I thought with 2006 recent, 2006. Was it 2006 God, it I am was. getting old because that seems like it's not that long ago no, it doesn't seem that long ago. On that level, I grant you. I remember it came out shortly after Superman Returns came out, like that. Like when they released Superman Returns to DVD, hmm. this you could get this movie in the box set, which is how I got Superman to the Richard Donner cut. So it was, you know, how they, that the, they released the movie over the summer, and by Christmas, it's out on DVD. So it was hmm. December or something of two thousand six. Well, I think looking into it, because you, you've known about this for a little while, and this was something you wanted to raise earlier, and I'm glad you had, because I'm, I, you know, I grew up, uh, I was more of a, um, a Marvel person growing up, but I did Superman, I think, for everybody, was the first superhero. And I well, think first the of Superman all, there were no film, other, when we were little kids, there weren't, I mean, you know, given we are men of a certain age, mm. and when we were, you know, before Batman came out in 89, there weren't any other big production superhero movies that i can think of that were around there, there was tv shows um but there this, this was shows, yeah. yeah and this this was the i think the first the superman franchise was the first real big budget uh superhero film my point and, exactly and the superman well okay this sort of opened up a a, a a thought for me just comparing superman superman the films and it reminded me how I think I preferred the second one to the first one. If we forget about this Donner Lester conversation. Yeah, this is a this is a question that comes up a lot. I do believe that the second one, if you look at the aggregation of reviews, tends to get better notices than the first one. I certainly remember my father saying that Superman 2 was an example of a sequel being better than the original. Mm. I have to say that in my dotage, if you want, my old age, as I moved past, you know, as a kid, I probably liked Superman 2 better because it has more action, right? It mm. is more about, I mean, Superman, Superman from the start of the movie, mm. the, uh, the, the theatrical release, the one we all grew up with and are most familiar with, presumptively, you know, that opening sequence that they designed with the, nuclear bomb in Paris and all. It's, it's really great. It's really, really great. You know, it's exciting. It's well choreographed. It's well done. Uh, Superman, the first one, the original, takes a while to get started. You know, we have to do yeah. 40, 45 minutes on the, you know, origin story of Superman. And especially now, you know, although I suppose then, but with the movies having become somewhat iconic, I think people's patience for that amount of expositive, you know, just narrative stuff to run through it uh, is limited, right? You know, like 45 mm -hmm. minutes before you meet Superman. And then even when you see him, you see him fly for a second, and then it takes another little bit of time before he does anything. Yes. But well, I will even... say, having said all that, my thing is I actually do prefer the first one. I think the first one hits the notes that they were looking for a little bit more than yeah. the second one does. I, th I think what, what makes the first one slower is the bad guy is not somebody he, he can actually physically take on. You know, it's Lex <laughs> Luthor is, is, you know, criminal mastermind. Um, and I, I think with, with Superman, the one thing I, I thought about when, when we review these films, it's how much latitude you give Superman. Because I think the character itself is almost... Um, when you first see it on the screen, the colors are very, it's almost like seeing Superman on the screen for the first time. I remember this reminded me of the first time I went to a Phillies game 
and the first really? time I saw the field. So th- this was the thought that came to my head because you know yeah. how it is when you go to your first professional For baseball sure. game and you walk out onto the, you know, into the, the, the field area and you see this expanse of green and these colors and these sounds and these smells. And Superman, you know, was a comic book character. And I think the first time the audience, the public saw a superhero on the big screen, it was very much vibrant and very sort of theatrical. And, and I think Superman, the film, get some passes for some of the, I guess, some of its flamboyant nature in storytelling. I, I don't think there's, as, as far as, you know, we always talk about continuity with these older films and, and some of the more ridiculous plot lines. I think Superman is riddled with it, but I think it gets a pass because of where it sits in the genre. If you're worried about realism, you've checked into the wrong <laughs> like theater if you're but, trying to watch Superman, right? But I'm not talking about realism. I'm talking about continuity to the story. So if you, oh, you know, I see for instance, you if you yeah. look at, at internal at, consistency. Um, yeah. So it, I'm not worried about realism. Um, but I think Superman gets mm-hmm. a bit of a pass because it's 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 more than just I think a superhero mm-hmm. film. It's the quintessential first draft. It's the first superhero film that was made. Well and yes. and uh, this this whole Donner Lester thing really raised for me, you know, the question of of how storytelling, how important storytelling is when you have this sort of unbelievable subject matter to contend with, and how you you make it compelling and interesting. And there, for me, was a big gulf, a, a surprising gulf in the difference in how the story was told between Donner and Lester, and they had well, very different resources at hand. They did, and I will also say, keep in mind that the Donner cut that you that exists that you saw that I've seen unfinished. It's unfinished, and also because he was not so. Just and if anyone doesn't know this, but I'm assuming if you're clicking on this, you probably do. But for the benefit of anyone who doesn't, they initially set out just like Back to the Future Part Two and Three to film Superman One and Two. Con- yes, basically at the same time. And in fact, I know you listened to some of the DVD commentary on uh, the Superman 2 Richard Donner cut. Did you listen to the yes. part where Richard Donner and Tom Mankiewicz, the original screenwriter, were, although Mario Puzo is credited for the story, Mankiewicz did a lot of the actual screenwriting on this first one especially. Uh, Donner talks about at one point, and Mankiewicz too, about how not only, you know, you would have with big name actors like Gene Hackman and Marlon Brando, and of course, Christopher Reeve was a nobody at this point. They were the yeah. two stars that not only would you have like, OK, they have to be finished by date X because they have other commitments, other projects. But they also had a start date like your production's ready to go or not. This is the window you have them for. Yeah. From January 1st to March 1st or whatever it is. So what ended up happening was. And you see it in the when you really watch them and look at them side by side, you can see what's going on. Is that the parts that Richard Donner was able to film in Superman 2 are really chiefly the parts with Lex Luthor and Marlon Brando. Yep. And anything that didn't involve them got in the end, they they kind of had to shift gears on their plan. They decided probably three quarters in the way into the way of shooting the first Superman film, they were too far behind schedule. The producer said, that's it. We got to get the first one out. So set aside doing any filming for anything that's going to wind up in Superman two, just finish one. And in doing that, they not only finished one, but they also like, for example, at the end of the Richard Donner cut, Superman pulls the trick of zipping around the world again. Yeah. Well, from what I understand, that was supposed to be, the original ending of Superman two and Superman one wasn't supposed to have that as an ending at all. Instead, it was supposed to end on a cliffhanger where you would see the rocket, you know, there's two rockets in Superman one and he promises Miss Tessmacher that he's going to go get the first one before he goes, gets the second one. So she'll take the kryptonite off him. So he does that and he grabs the first one and he pushes it out into space. Then the other one, while he's doing that hits. And so he ends up having to deal with, the aftermath of its hit. But the way the first one was supposed to end was that first one goes out into space, blows up, and that's how those guys get, you know, released from the Phantom Zone. And that was basically supposed to be the last shot of the first one is mm. then escaping and then roll credits, 
next year see it Superman 2, right? Yeah. And it was going to be one continuous story. But they ended up having to put this, they ended up having to come up with a different ending for the original Superman, so he spins the world around in the first one. And then when it came time to do Superman 2, they had the footage that they'd shot with Brando and Hackman, anything involving those guys. And of course, if Christopher Reeve or any of the villains were in those scenes, and they're there too. But they had to go back and actually shoot. So all the honeymoon stuff that where they're posing as honeymooners in Canada, anything that's just him and Margot Kidder is basically shot by Richard Lester. And so that's where, you know, when they're putting that Richard Donner cut together, they only have so much to work with because a lot of the things that he would have done, he did not get to do because he didn't come back to film you know, to finish finish up Superman two, and also he was forced to end Superman one in a way that was not originally intended. Yeah, I think you end up with two directors who were yeah. hamstrung in very different ways. So Correct. Richard Richard Lester is stuck with a certain amount of what he yeah. would not have done, and then has to make a movie around it. Yeah, you know, conversely. And and I think it, what what struck me was was how how there was such a differentiation or deviation. Um, and I wasn't aware that the the element about the ending. And I think no matter when Superman was going to turn the Earth backwards at any point in time, that was a bad idea, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> at any time, at the, both endings, I could have done without either of those. I mean, I think it's the biggest criticism of the first film. In the second film, it doesn't work at all. They just wanted a different ending. They did not like the way that Superman 2, as it was released, ended. And honestly, the idea that Superman has some kind of magic kiss that makes Lois forget things doesn't it doesn't have a lot of internal logic to it either so let's <laughs> let's come back to that because maybe we should go through the film and and look at those differences um mm-hmm. and just maybe maybe make an assessment on those key differences and then we're going to score which one we like the best and and just before i get into it so if i were to tell you what i found as far as what the superman fandom i think prefer would that skew you in any way at this stage or should we save that Oh, I think I know what the Superman fandom prefer. So, so what? So they? So, and I think we would you like? Okay, what do you think it is? Just so I that I maybe. The, I think they prefer the Richard Donner cut. Yeah. So that that is the the popular view. Now, looking at the the film, we have. Let's start with the 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 main difference. I think the first bit, and you highlighted it, was how Zod and crew were released from the what was it the Infinity or Phantom, Phantom Zone? Phantom Zone. Um, so in in the Donner cut, like you said, they just have they hit a, a, a I guess an unexploded nuclear mm-hmm. missile from the first one, and that releases them. And then in the uh, Lester version, it was an explosion from the scene in Paris that was added. Um, what was your preference between those two? I mean, is, do you feel I like think we can that go the first is much? I think as in terms of. I, I like the idea that they were supposed to be a continuous story. And I think the connection from film one to film two makes a lot more sense. If it's the nuke that he shoves out into space, you know, it has this kind of serendipity to it. And you know, if you start thinking too hard about the plot of either Superman or Superman two, but especially Superman two, it doesn't matter whose cut it is. There's a lot of silliness in it, but at least it, you know, with the missile being pushed out into space that he has saved, it kind of connects story elements together yeah. and it continues and drives that same notion of things happen for a reason that clearly is stated throughout certainly the first Superman. I mean, it's what uh, Superman's adoptive father says to him uh, early on in the first film. The Clark is complaining to his adoptive father saying, because he plays the nerd, right, in high mm. school. And you see how he's then treated by the jocks, right, as typical that you might expect, jocks treating nerds like, like you know, like they're dirt. And he complains to his dad. He's like, they, they don't understand. I could, if I played on the football team, I could score a touchdown every time, every time. And you see that he gets some of where the idea comes from from him that he's supposed to hide or – not hide, but like – not be showy and not use Mm. because i think think how any human being would be if you actually had superpowers of course you'd immediately think well how can i use this to enrich myself and he's got the he's got his stepfather in his ear and his stepfather says to him i think it's really one of the most poignant lines in any of the superman films he says listen 
I don't, all I know is you're here for a reason. I don't know whose reason or what reason it is, but you're here for a reason and it's not to score touchdowns, you know, and that kind of sets the frame of there is a, 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 a sort of guiding intelligence to what's going on and things don't just happen willy nilly. So the idea that that missile gets, it's a, it's a, um, of course, it, on the one level, it's a coincidence of all the places in the space in the hu- huge universe. You push this missile out into space that you're saving the world from, and it just happens to go right by the Phantom Zone. It's crazy, but it yeah. makes sense within that concept of things are happening for a reason. The tact on scene, while I think it's exceptionally well constructed, that whole opening sequence in Paris, it doesn't really resonate with that in the same way. I I don't I think I'm this is one of the scenes where I I could take either cuz I remember enjoying the the Paris scene. Um It's a fun, uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and I I think for me what what makes me lean towards the Leicester Paris scene is and it's a small detail but the fact that a nuclear explosion tore apart the phantom zone as opposed to, and it's not just that the phantom zone came by it was a missile this you know probably about 15 feet wide barreling through space happens to hit this phantom zone this this you know in you know i don't know what it is this dimension and this piece of american hardware has you know broken this whole dimension up and and they've escaped and i i think that is for me that would make me lean towards the paris uh paris one also what makes you think it's american hardware it's american hardware it is it's 1970 everything even though it's in paris well, no, no. Is it the nuclear the nuclear um, nuclear missile was an American missile, wasn't it? Yeah, but in the first the, one. But, yeah, but that's the first. That's what I mean. First... I'm sa- that's the American okay. hardware. The the missile, right? But that is. missile is written out of Superman. Like the the Lester version, the Paris version. They have a hydrogen bomb. They don't tell you where they got it. It's just these terrorists. They have a hydrogen bomb. No, I'm talking about the missile is from the Donner. Correct. Uh, yeah. Yes. I'm saying the missile from the Donner. That's it. We're having a bit of a semantic conversation on the nuclear missile that broke it, whereas the the Lester one wasn't a missile. It was an explosion from inside of an elevator. So that's where the main difference was. Oh, I see what you say. That is certainly the difference. Yeah. Um, but so you like the Paris version better then? I lean towards the Paris version, but I, I could take or leave both. I think for me, I prefer having that scene. I don't th- – because the whole the whole – film franchise connects anyway. I don't need that obvious connection between, okay, this missile's up in the sky, hits the Phantom Zone, and and we have this synchronicity now. I don't feel like that adds that much to it for me. But it's I'm, I'm splitting hairs between these. I, I agree. I don't think that... Because the Paris scene is a lot of fun, and I gotta say, I don't know about you, the most fun thing about it, in a sense, is when he learns of what's going on in Paris, but he's still in Metropolis... I certainly played, uh, pretended I was Superman a lot as a kid. I don't know if you did. <laughs> and the 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 sequence where he changes from Clark Kent to Superman by running down the alley and you know starting to rip his shirt, and then he just changes from clothes from one to the other. Yeah, I probably played that scene in my living room ten thousand times growing up. Right? Well, the way they brought in the score too with that. I mean, yeah, it's it's all I very well done. I think between those two, I think most people who like one or the other would agree that, yeah, I could take one or the other. So I think we can even say that that's that's a you prefer one. I prefer the other. Let's say that's a draw, really, between those scenes. I would agree, although I will say one thing about the Paris scene that and again, this is being nitpicky and watching it for a show like we're doing right now, which I don't I'd never done before. I don't know that it ever would have occurred to me until uh, if I hadn't been doing it this way. When I'm watching that the the Superman two we got the Richard Lester one, and Superman arrives in Paris, isn't it funny that he knows exactly where to go? You know he he without talking to anyone, without having any real. I mean, he left Metropolis. Obviously, some amount of time has elapsed, so he knows generally that there's a nuke. At the Eiffel Tower, he yeah. does not know. They show that the elevator, the authorities in Paris have attempted to solve the situation by, you know, uh, blasting the elevator. That was a mistake because the elevator starts to drop and the bomb yeah. is now armed. He can't know that the bomb is armed. He can't know that it's on the elevator. He gets there. He stops the falling elevator 
And Lois says, oh, there's a bomb. But she doesn't say, oh, it's on the elevator or it's armed. And she doesn't know, that, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> and he just immediately lifts the elevator through the top of the Eiffel Tower and throws it out into space without asking a single question of anyone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, so really, he should have been surprised when it blew up in space. Like, oh, shit. Well, I guess it's not. I mean, I guess there. you could, I mean, you could start filling in like, well, Superman is x-ray vision, so he can use his x-ray vision to and see, you can see, the, yeah. see it in his arm, you know. But don't think too hard. They're Superman movies. <laughs> this is where, this is exactly the thing. I think I give the Superman franchise more grace in those sort of areas right. because I could, I, the, I thought the same thing. I was watching the both cuts and in each cut, I'm like, I could tear the shit out of both of these films. Just like oh God. some oh. of the crazy things that are going on. So, and I mean, I think that it's exacerbated by the fact that it's done by two directors, right? Where each one, Richard Donner, when they're trying to assemble his cut well after the fact, they're stuck with the fact that obviously there were things he would have filmed but did not. So they got to throw in stuff from that Richard Lester did that doesn't really match his style or whatever, yeah. but they did it. And on the Richard Lester side, they got to throw in things that either make up for stuff because there were rules, right? He could, there were things that they clearly reshot for no good reason other than he had to have like a certain percentage of the film as released had to have been directed like he had to have been the director for otherwise they under uh, director's guild of america rules he could not be credited as the director yeah so you know <laughs> so yep because it will just be yeah because the the amount of content he had to be correct responsible exactly for. they literally yeah. had to hit a certain percentage. So why don't we move on to the next piece, which is uh, and if uh, if I miss anything in order, but I think the next major piece is is Lois discovering how uh, who who Clark Kent really is. I think is is the next major differentiation between the two. Oh people. yes, yes. And I I have for me this is an easy one, unlike the last one. Where do you see it? Well, I will say that the screen. Oh, by the way, hold on. Before you go, should we should we not uh, highlight the, the difference first? Oh, we should. Let's, let's frame it. Point. So, in the first one, um, essentially, Lois, and in both, Lois has an idea. When that you Clark say the first Superman. one, you're going to need to be more specific. Sorry. <laughs> in in the Lester version um, and in the Donner version, both essentially Lois is is getting uh, switched on to the fact that Clark Kent is Superman. And in both versions, they have a very different way of going about it. Now, um, in the Donner version, Lois, uh, as her first attempt to figure it out, decides, I'm going to jump out of the window of the Daily Planet, and you're here, Clark, so therefore Superman isn't going to let me die. And she jumps out, and then Clark Kent, in some sort of a clever way, manages to save her without giving away his identity. In the theatrical cut, the Lester cut, Lois... Uh, in Niagara, jumps into the the well, not into the falls, but jumps into the falls down the falls, and Clark has to save her. And then in the uh, Donner cut, the way it was unveiled, uh, she actually shoots Clark with what seemingly is a gun. Clark, uh, and then gives up that he's Superman, and it turns out she shot him with a blank. It was quite clever. And then in the Lester version. Superman, if you've ever, ever seen it, has fallen into a fire. She realizes his hand's not burned. Ah, you're Superman. And Clark gives it up. Um, so I just wanted to frame that for anybody who maybe hadn't watched it. And Andrew, what do you think? I, I would say it's a little hard for me in that when you're watching the Donner cut version of this, they're having to use, they're actually assembling two different screen tests, the solo Christopher Reeve screen, screen test, and then the Margot Kidder screen test, which they did mm. once Christopher Reeve had already been cast. So he's in that. But they, in fact, if you look at the DVD set, you can see the same sequence with for two or three other actresses. And I will say that Margot Kidder is far and away, when you watch them comparing one-to-one, -one, she clearly deserved the part. So good for Margot Kidder. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, so you're looking at a screen test. You're looking at an unfinished product. It feels a little, you know, it just doesn't feel polished and done. But I take the screenwriter's point, which is that, the way, because early in the Donner cut, the first sequence really in the Donner cut, one of the things about the Donner cut is because it's supposed to be, they were doing them at the same time, Superman 2 is really supposed to begin like the next day after yeah. Superman 1 ends. And Lois is now putting it together. And at the very outset of the film, she throws herself 
out a window to challenge Clark. She's like, I think I, this is how sure I am that you're Superman. You won't let me die. And she throws herself out a window. And then, you know, so the screenwriter makes the argument, see, that then resonates in their version of the scene when she says, I risked my life. That was my mistake the first time. This time I'm going to risk yours when she mm-hmm. pulls out the gun. And then, of course, it turns out it was loaded with blanks. So in general, I agree with the screenwriter that that is a better construction because it's not completely done. Uh, it's hard to say. I would almost call it a draw, uh, but I do like the way that the Donner version is written slightly better if it had been completed. So I guess if pushed on it, I would go with the Donner version. I would obvious for me. It's an obvious Lester version. Um, okay, I'm I'm quite. So my my issue with the Donner version is I think it's quite contrived, and I think it's it's just it doesn't flow very well. So the first scene, she she she's looking at a newspaper, and I I I like the elements in the Donner version, but I don't like the way it works in with the story. So she sees Clark's really shitty disguise of a pair of glasses, finally figures it out using a marker and a newspaper. I have no problem with that, but then she decides I'm going to risk my life and jump out of the window of of the Daily Planet, and I have all sorts of problems with that. Just I just think it's like really immature. It's really like like a childish solution to what is a really good reporter, really intelligent person. Yes. Whereas if you compare it to the Niagara Falls version, I can buy her jumping into the, uh, to the river more than I can having her jump out of the, uh, the window of the daily planet. And the way that, and the way that Clark Kent deals with both of those situations, the, what the Lester version is much more, I think is more clever in, in how he, he is able to save her and not look like Superman. Whereas the whole process of running down the stairs and what he does is he blows to slow down her descent, uses his x-ray vision, which somebody on the street looks at, you know, actually reacts to the x-ray vi- or whatever. That's sorry, a the, good the, point. I missed that. <laughs> so if you, if you watch it, cause if, when he shoots his, his, uh, I, I don't know what to call it, but is when he shoots his heat fire vision, eyes, heat vision. yeah, heat vision, at a at a um it was a, a an overhang uh, i don't know what they call awning. It, marquee awning awning yeah. it opens up and then lois hits it and falls on a fruit stand and for me that just seemed it almost seemed like fuck how are we going to make this work if she's going to jump out of the window um run downstairs use his breath use his eyes and she'll be fine whereas the scene with niagara He's running alongside trying to save her. He looks obviously like, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to jump in to save her. I'm not Superman. And he uses his vision to get a log down and he jumps in to save her. To me, it just seemed like a much more mature and more plausible way to, to go through that process. I, I, you know, you could talk me into your point of view and I'll tell you why. I mean, Mankiewicz, when you listen to the DVD commentary on the Donner cut is very enamored of his solution to this, you know, how the scenes come together. Uh, I agree with you though. He really thinks that this is impressive opening to the film that Lois first thing is she throws herself out a window to make a point. Um, and I, I agree. I don't think that's nearly as convincing as he seems to think it is. I do think if they had been able to complete the sort of payoff on that scene where she's like, wait a minute, my problem was I risked my life. I ought to risk yours. Mm. That scene probably would have worked better because in the Lester version, she figures it out. Like he, he goes to all that trouble. And then like a minute later, he just trips and puts his hand in the fire and he doesn't even really a try to explain it away. He starts and then he's like, ah, forget it. <laughs> yeah, yes, you're right. Yeah. I am. And like that, that felt like weak to me. Well, the, the only reason I let that pass, because I, I, my issue with that, because that's not without fault, because what I would say is I would like a combination of the two, because I thought the blank in the gun was a quite a clever little scene. I liked how they did that. And yeah. I think they could have done something sort of a hybrid between the two, but I, they they covered it through sort of the dialogue where she says maybe you 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 know wanted to yeah tell they, they're making it like a psychological thing like, like he's he's subconsciously being a dickhead about this and and but 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 for me it's it's yeah. when when I look at those two side by side and I look at the flow of the film and how it unfolded it sort of unfolded rather naturally and progressively in the Lester version whereas mm-hmm. I'm not clear in the Donner version if how convinced she is after she falls into the fruit stand. That that's Superman, and it, it's it for me. There's there's I just 
I have trouble buying it. And part of it may be because it's incomplete. But just conceptually, the, the way that the Lester version works for me, it just seems like it fits so much better into the plot. You know, I think you might be talking me into your point of view on this because as I'm thinking about it, one of the things that – I I mean, both films are going for it, Superman, the original, and then both versions of Superman, too. But I think because the Lester version is the complete version, I think it comes across perhaps a little bit better. I think that's fair. Is the idea that what fools Lois about Clark Kent versus Superman is not the goofy pair of glasses and the hat, because that's ridiculous. Yeah. And everybody knows this. It's not the physical disguise it is the psychological disguise it's the nerviness it's the yes. nerdiness the unsureness and and i think i think christopher reeve might does an right. incredible job with that he does and i think you might be right that the payoff in the lester which i initially thought of as like well tripping on a rug and putting your hand in the fire i wish it would have been a little bit because to me like if you're committed to it People have accidentally gotten their hands in a fire and come away. You know what I mean? Like stranger things have happened. Yeah. Oh, it looked like then, it was in the fire. Actually, it was bent, and I just didn't have it in there. It looked like I was burnt. Honestly, yeah. I'm fine. I'm more scared than he, anything he else. Could have, he could have talked his way out of that without a problem if he's a committed yeah. liar, which he has been apparently for his entire life. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? Like it's not. <laughs> they, they could have. I think the perfect ending to that would have been to have him fall in the fire. He does a shitty job of covering it up. Then Lois gets out the gun. For me, that, uh, that, kind of, that would be a clever way to do it. But but the thing is that with what you were starting to talk me into is the notion that that what she says to him is well maybe you wanted to that it is that so if you're going to get into the psychology of it that there's conscious and there's subconscious yeah and he may be consciously trying and of course he is to play this dual dual role this duality out mm. but that there's something subconsciously. You know, I don't know. That does suddenly seem, as you yeah. talk, to to kind of, you know, what I've changed my mind. I think you're right. Oh, I wow. agree. Yes, I I think when when I look at the the whole disguise piece, um, and I, I was listening to other people who made YouTube videos on this, talking about how, um, and and I do like the idea of her taking the newspaper with the the permanent marker and coloring it in. I thought, yeah, that's, sure, that's, that's that it. worked. But it, it's. Where, where, where? For me, it's how long has she been working with him at that point, and how long she spent like a whole evening flying around with Superman in the first one as well. Yes, and I, I think you know when she saw him in in you know Niagara Falls cleaning his glasses. I mean, at that point, you know, I think that was the point when it starts to to change over. Um, but from there, I think the scenes are. I don't think there's a major difference, but again, I think you you're fifty fifty. I may be leaning towards Lester on that. I think I, I think you've kind of talked me into that that, that is a better actually it, it does work a little bit better. And it does feel like in the what they released, it feels appropriate because it also works, you know, I don't know that Lois jumping into the water would be any more mature than her jumping out of a building. In one sense, except that not a few minutes before we have seen Superman come and save a little boy who fell from a much greater height. There's a little bit more evidence there for her. Right. So that she could kind of that that does sort of work a little bit better. And there's more build up to the moment. So my logical mind and everything. My my logical mind looks at her jumping out of a window and and just thinking about this. If I was in her position now, I'm over you know, analyzing this, but just for the sake of this conversation, her jumping out of the building, that's like it. She's, she's got about three seconds to be right or wrong. Whereas she doesn't jump out of it. I paid attention to this. Cause I rewatched, I literally watched one scene, then the other, then one scene, then the other, she j- jumps what 15 feet into a, a dangerous rapid. So there's an element where she expects to survive the fall and she is now time to be saved. And for me, that's like if we're if we're going to really break this down, that's that's where that maybe sort of crack in the armor for me started to show when I compare those two. There's also a one crack, which, again, this is this comes from watching it for an analysis purpose. Never occurred to me before. Wouldn't have occurred to me. I don't think this time if I hadn't been thinking in these terms, he doesn't want to get in the water, doesn't want to reveal the secret. Very good. Okay. So he uses his heat vision to separate a log and have it fall in rapid water. Hmm. <clears throat> that like he has no control over whether that's going to work or not. He does one hmm. log. 
it could have immediately gone like you know the complete it works and then what he's gonna watch her drown you know (laughs) i think i think at that stage it was like all right if this doesn't work i may need to put on the red and blue at that That stage i think he's got to make that decision so that we we have a so i think we move on to the next piece Well, before we move on i need 30 Mm -hmm. seconds here yes because one thing that they cut from the donner version because it is extremely richard lester so I get why they cut it. He had nothing to do with this, but it is an amazing little 30 second vignette. The guy who is the little concierge or Butler or bellboy who brings them up, bellhop oh, yeah. who brings them up to there and he shows them around the hotel, looks at the, car. this part is in the Donner version because they couldn't cut it for continuity purposes. They needed to have at least this much in where he says, uh, Mr. And Mrs. Smith. <laughs> and like, because it's, it, it's about a society that's no longer with us. Like yeah, yeah. where people would pretend to be married so they could go, you know, register yeah. at a hotel together yeah. and all that yeah. right but like uh you know and then his whole attitude walking through there is just amazing it's so well done well that, that uh, and i think this is where we start and before i go to the next because i think the next big piece is is um his his uh fortress of solitude did i say that right Yes, the fortress. Before I go to that though, there was one scene, um, and maybe this is a Lester thing, but this is where I started to maybe lean towards Lester. And it was the scene where um Zod and I can't remember, I never remember the other two names, um, land in the water. And yes. uh, the way Donner did this, and I and you may be able to help me out this, it was a bit more, you know, on and, and up, and they they kind of move forward into the town. I really like the scene, and this is a very, from what I understand, very Lester thing where she burns the snake. That show. She picks up a snake, it bites her, she throws it on the ground and discovers she's got heat vision. And then the stupid one picks it up and then tries to use the heat vision, and it doesn't work. And it was such a cute little scene, and that was something that was very, and for me, just the way that unfolded, I actually found I missed that when I watched the Donner scene. I'm like, oh, where's the, where's the thing where he's picking up the snake and figures out he can't, because later in the film, um, actually, why don't we talk about this, because we're on it next, that whole scene in the town, because that was actually more different than I expected it to be. When we go to the town then, it makes, it, it connects this clever little joke where he uses his heat vision to blow up, um, I think it was like a car or something. He looks at Zod for approval and Zod just sort of goes, you know, like, ugh, like this idiot. And I thought that was a clever scene. It, for me, it added so much value with that little setup at the beginning. And that was something that I think Lester was superior at with these sort of subtle little jokes. And I read that the cast enjoyed that, that, you know, bit of humor to the film. And I, I think superhero films, a lot of them, I think they benefit from those little interludes of humor. I mean, you are seeing a very different style start to unfold. Yeah. And they remember Lester filmed all of that. All that stuff was filmed by Lester. So what winds up in the Donner version is basically what was required to make the movie hang together. Yeah. But Donner talks about how he wanted, he had a vision that the villains Zod, Ursula, and or Ursa, Ursula, I think, and Non, I think, is the Non, that's it. Yeah. That they be real threats, that they be menacing. And as much as Terrence Stamp's performance is, as Zod is amazing, it is very good. It, it, it's a, I, my favorite thing in the whole film, honestly. Either version, it's in prison, both when they're in the diner and Superman has the encounter. Well, he's not Superman anymore, and mm. he has the encounter with that bully at the truck stop or whatever. And then they, you know, after the fight's over, they're looking up at the TV, and that's when he learns that Zod and his pals have been been uh, on Earth this whole time. Mm. And Zod. You know, the president starts to say, like, listen, I've uh, uh, in order to blah, blah, blah. You know, he's like he's announcing I'm, I'm bending the knee. I'm, I'm doing what I need to do. And he then starts to say, oh, Superman, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Grab, like, like, please help. Mm. And Zod comes and grabs the microphone and says, who is this Superman? You know, who are you? Come kneel before me. Show yourself. Kneel before Zod. And then the best part is there's like this two second beat where he's just staring at the camera and then he just screams Zod one more time for no reason. <laughs> and it gets me every time. Zod! Zod! 
<laughs> never, I need to go back and watch that again. Oh, it's 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 it's, it's brilliant. But uh, Taron Stamp's performance is amazing. But you are seeing a divergence right in these sequences between less because Donner has it in his mind, so he says that he wants these people to be very serious threats to Superman in a way that Lex Luthor, who is the jokey kind of person, yeah. and in fact, a lot of. What's interesting is if you watch the Donner cut, there's a lot more footage of Lex Luthor in the Donner cut than there yeah. is in, and a lot of his lines are jokes that are yeah. removed from a, by a guy who liked jokiness. But again, well, I think that they were shooting for percentage. So, so like can, I, can what, I jump in Donner on that really quick? Doing, well, sure, just really ahead. quick, because I have an yeah. example. Sorry, because this was well before the scene. There was one obvious joke that that really to me stood out that Lester removed in the prison. And it's a subtle one. And you, I, the only reason I saw it is I watched one than the other, and I just happened to pick up on it. And he said something about alpha waves or the black box. And um, and Otis was like, yeah, I think he said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's it. And, and he made a comment that, about chicken or something in the Donner. It was like a really stupid joke about, yeah, well, I really like chicken. Uh, you know, if, if it was about chicken, you'd understand. And Lester removed that. And to me, it, it just looked like that that joke was something that any director would have pulled from the film and i don't think it's fair to judge donner on that because he may well have pulled that ultimately but there there was a, an obvious to me difference in the way donner would deliver a joke versus lester lester was more physical and facial expression oh yeah and donner was very verbal and very more overt very obvious in how he delivered some of that i mean i will say this for donner in general especially if you watch the first film he and his team took the material very seriously. And you have to mm. keep in mind, this movie's coming out in the late 70s. You're only not even quite a decade removed, or I guess maybe by now you are about a decade removed from the end of the, you know, the Batman TV show the, mm. that was so campy. Mm. And comic books were thought of as this silly kid stuff so that you could either do it as a Saturday morning, car Saturday morning cartoon show on a very rudimentary level for little kids, or you could do it as a, for adults as sort of like tongue-in-cheek, ha, 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 isn't this all hilarious? And he's trying to create a Superman film that still has a lightness to it, that's mm. not overly serious, but that it can be taken seriously mm. by an adult audience. And he was trying to continue that by making these villains serious threats. Lester was English, you know, and England comic books were never a thing the way they were here in America. The notion of a superhero. I mean, now it's, you know, 50 years on, so I'm sure a lot of these characters, the cultures have intermingled and there's probably more appreciation for this, but it's comic books are a, if you want to call it an art form, they are one of your few originally rarely American art forms. Mm. And it's a very American concept and Lester grew up without it. And so he, I think saw the whole thing as kind of goofy and silly and he was a goofy, silly kind of guy himself. So he brought this sort of goofy, silly aesthetic and therefore doesn't, he doesn't care about internal. Like if you're talking about, or as you were earlier in this, internal consistent logic he doesn't care about that at all and mm. you can see that in the final version of superman too it's all over the place but the scene that you just mentioned would be one you pointed to where non picks up the stick and the joke is like he watched ursa do this and then he can't ha 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 okay because he's a big dummy on the other hand if you think about it for even one second if a snake bites superman what happens to superman None. not a thing does he even feel it? The snake's teeth probably break, right? Mm. Why does she react the way she does? Why does it hurt her? She then throws it down. Makes no internal sense at all. He I think, though, there's, there's the multiple times where important. Superman, though, I would say that there's, that's an inconsistent piece with Superman in general, just even him. There's times where he gets injured and things like, like he looks like he's hurting for things that he shouldn't be hurt doing. But that is, that is I think, for me, I didn't pick up on that. And I think that's a fair point to, to raise with Ursula. Yes. And, uh, I mean, you see that as the film progresses, especially in the ending sequence of Superman 2, which we'll get to, Remind me of the mm. Richard of the Richard Lester the re theatrically released version. The ending sequence and the stuff that Lester shot makes literally no sense, and it's just there for his somewhat goofy aesthetic. <laughs> so well, let's let's we have so and the one thing I wanted to highlight, and it's not necessarily a major difference, but the way they cut together the fight sequence with the town 
even the way they brought into play the um, the sheriff and the the deputy um, in the Lester version, I watched those side by side. There's actually quite a bit of difference in those in that setup. Um, the Donner version didn't have any of the bit where you know the the gun was thrown under the police car. They're quite fascinated with it. Non goes, lifts up the yeah. car, picks it up, drops it down. And, and the reason this this to me was an important piece because the next scene is is the police officer and sorry this the deputy and the sheriff rolling into town looking at their damaged car and for me the lester version had a really nice flow with the storyline into how the conflagration in the town came about in yes. the donner version it just happens and there's no real context for it i agree and, and i think this is where for me i'm starting to see a more skilled director in Lester than that of Donner. In my, this is where my brain is going. Well, I would object to that on this point, that all of that sequence, all of it, was filmed by Lester. And the whole point of the Richard Donner cut was to maximize, and they have the same rules, right? If you're going to call it the Richard Donner cut, you got to have a film that's more than 50% shot by Richard Donner. So it's now the same process in reverse. He is therefore, they're being very selective in what they choose to use mm. out of stuff that was exclusively shot by Lester because A, they're trying to go for a different tone. So they're going to cut out all the little Lester-y jokes. And the Lester jokes are... You know, when once you know what, who Richard Lester is, like, and obviously he did, he directed a Hard Day's Night, you know, mm. and so if you're familiar with those kinds of, and there, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just the question is, does it fit Superman or not, or does it fit what Donner wanted to do? Clearly, it doesn't fit what Donner wanted to do. So they are going to excise anything that doesn't really work with what. Donner's doing, and they want something lean. They want something that's going to be as much Donner as possible. So, in sequences that are entirely shot by Lester, they got to just pick what just enough to make continuity hang together and then move on. But so, I, I agree. I it, doesn't Lester really, sh- it doesn't really added. work in the Donner version because it happens too fast, and you're like, why are they there? What's going on? I totally agree with that. But I think that's a limitation of the fact that obviously, if Donner had come back and shot the film as was originally intended, he would have shot his own set of sequences. But, yeah. I, and I, I, but for me, what I start questioning when I was looking into this is, is, is the Donner, Donner uh, outcome a situation of him not being organized enough in, in filmmaking, in, in management of time, in management of budget? Um, oh, there's yeah. one interview, and, and I think, <laughs> what's that? I said, yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, and but but I think that goes down. You have to take that into account when you're making a film. If you haven't organized your time to the point that you can't create the piece of work that you wanted to, is that your fault of the producers? Because Lester came in with more constraints and uh, less budget and was able to get his storyline across, though it has faults. And this is where I see because I, I just the whole what bothered me is when I look at the collection, if I remove the Lester additions to the to the town siege scene, and from the point they come into town to the point that they're at the White House, and even like the, the Donner bit had the bit where they carve their faces into Mount Rushmore, which well, I thought they cut was cut that from the Donner version. Yeah, that's Instead, what I mean. Instead they 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 topple the Washington Monument in the Donner version. Yeah, which which well, in, no, the Donner version had the the national the Mount Rushmore piece, not the no, Lester the, the version. Lester ver- the Lester version has the Mount Rushmore piece. Well, I don't know about that. Pretty sure. We'll have to check that out. Um, but the, the, I'm the, pretty the, sure. In fact, I can tell you that the Donner one of the things that they never filmed for the Donner piece that, and I think this is why they show you the Washington Monument being toppled. Oh yeah, because the reverse in time piece that that goes back up. There's the reversing time, but also that was just one little sliver. Like originally what they had written was that they were going to show, and this is pursuant to the idea of these bad guys being true global, terrific physical threats to Superman, is that they were going to show a whole sequence of them running around and defacing famous world, you know, top of the Washington Monument. I think Mm. if you go to Superman 3, Mm. um, there's a point when he's evil Superman without getting into the details of that film where he in a, in a drunken sort of he's evil, drunk and feeling nasty. So to be a, a prick, basically, he takes the leaning tower of Pisa and, and straight. Yeah. Well, that was, a, <laughs> a was originally 
thought I con- conceived of for Superman two for those villains to do, but they mm. never got around to filming it. And then I guess they liked it. So they wound up sticking it in Superman yeah. three. Well, the, 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 and, and I think where, where we may differ. So would you, so for me, it was, it was a big thing for me. This is where the, 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 I started to shift towards Lester, that whole process, like the film, I rewatched both of those films from, from landing in town, Houston, to White House, and it just was for me starkly different. Um, and for me, that's where I started to lean towards Lester. That series of scenes. I mean, here's what I would say. I, I, to me, there's two separate, distinct questions that have now been introduced. One is which is better, the Superman two, the what we got, or Superman two Richard Donner cut? Yes. And then there is the question of who's a better director, Richard Lester or Richard Donner. I think I could have the answer that I probably prefer what they were going to do. And, of course, the Superman 2 Richard Donner cut is never really going to be because they just didn't do enough of it. It's only kind of like a a sketch of what they were shooting for. I probably think that that winds up being a, a more consistent Superman film with the first film on the whole than what we actually got. But do I think that Richard Donner is a better director than Richard Lester? Uh, I think Richard Lester may, in fact, be a better director than Richard Donner. But for partly, I mean, just from a business perspective, mm. he clearly is, as you pointed out. Yeah. Because Donner had was given, like, basically a blank. He he, he didn't think in terms of... He, he didn't think he had a budget. Yeah. He, he, they asked, Somebody asked, I read an interview uh, where somebody asked him about his budget, and he's like, I haven't given it a budget. So the only people that ever say that are the people that should have the budget. Really, yeah, given the budget. Precisely. But, so let's let's because just to make sure we're getting through, there's a few other points that maybe we should cover. And one of which I wanted to get your opinion on was the the um, Fortress of Solitude scenes and how he loses his power and gets it back. Um, I so and I think the question is down to Marlon Brando or his mother. And 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 there's two very different. Oh, ways Marlon Brando all the way. I'm the other way. I actually so for me the Marlon Brando scene. I struggle with the different uh, either with Lex Luthor there or with Superman there. Like the, the whole scene where Lois. So for me, here's where where I struggle, and I'm just going to compare these quickly. Lois wants to learn more about him. In the Donner version, she goes straight to bone in him and then sees him losing his powers. <laughs> which which really Superman losing his powers is the equivalent of like a teenager getting his girlfriend's tattoo on his ass. Because he's making a decision that his dad's saying, You can't go back if you do this. If you tattoo this name on your ass, you're stuck with this tattoo on your ass. Mm-hmm. And that's what he does. He he pretty much loses his powers. And the way that conflagrates in the Donner version is just like Shit happens, and then he doesn't have powers. In the Lester version, she's learning about the space, learning about Superman, and then they naturally bone. And and to me, I'm okay with that. And then when we take a look at the well, Marlon you notice Brando, that the biggest difference is that in the Lester version, they don't bone until yeah, they do, don't they? No, they do, but not yeah. until after he has yes. given up his powers. In the Donner version, they do it before he gives up his powers, which does sort of. I mean, there's a lot of logical questions there. I mean, like, first and foremost, why does he have to give up his powers? Well, if the answer is, well, if you want to, you know, if you want to do the, the horizontal hokey pokey, first and mm. foremost, on a, on a purely physical level, you're going to have to change your molecular structure. Yeah. In order, that would make a certain amount of, like, internal sense. And so Lester's version on that level makes more sense. Like, if he could do it without having to give up the powers, then why does he have to give up the powers? Yeah. The, However, the Marlon Brando bit was good. That was the one bit about Brando the Marlon Brando bit that was good. Explanation. See, there's yeah. no explanation with, I don't, I mean, I understand they had to re-record the dialogue without Marlon Brando. That has to do with salaries and money and, you know, okay, it's business. But why didn't you give the same dialogue and explanation? The mom is just more like, well, you know, uh, well, if you're going to do this, then you, if you're going to live with one of them, then you have to be one of them. And it's like one sentence. But like Marlon Brando kind of walks him through it and says like, well, you know, if this is what you want, you know, then it follows this. But, you know, think about what you're giving up. Think about, you know, he he starts with the whole reasoning of 
the dedication of your life to one person is mutually exclusive to the idea that you're going to dedicate your life to all people. Yeah. Well, you can't well, do he, he essentially says, why are you being a selfish prick? Correct. Aren't there other people out there? And the, the, my, my issue with that scene isn't Marlon Brando as such, although his floating hologram annoys me throughout the whole thing. It's a big head yeah. here. It's a stand-up person here. It's a massive giant here. And it's just like there's no rhyme or reason to it. But that scene, that's the best piece with Marlon Brando. But then Clark Kent, and I think part of it, and I saw somebody mention this, and I thought it was a really good point. This was early doors they were filming when, when uh, Christopher Reeve was getting his Superman chops down, his Clark Kent chops down. And the acting in that scene with Clark Kent, he sounds like a petulant child when he's like, I, I want to I wanna continue bounding her, and I don't give a shit about all these people. Now, right. I, think it's, I think the scene is all right, but for me, the, the hologram and you know the explanation does help, but I never questioned that whole logic. And, and for me, just the simple fact, it's stupid. I appreciate this, but the simple fact that they had like a television set up with the crystal, it was a consistent thing, and the mother he was – like for me, it just worked better than having this floating hologram she everywhere. She becomes a body to. too. Does she? She no, but does. The, when? She's always in the crystal on that one. Always. Mm. Well, you see now, I, I'm, I'm starting to question. I was surprised to see it where she comes out and is a body. And I'm like, wait a minute. Do I have an extended version? Of is this Superman when he gets his power that? back? No, I don't know. No, no. This is when he gives it up and she walks out. And I remember, like, I just watched it last night. Oh, is that and when remember, he goes into the thing and she walks out? and, and Yeah, and she's crystal. hanging out. So she does the same thing. That's what I, I, I don't think that, I will grant you that Christopher, part of the problem, even with the way it was filmed in the Donner version, is that suddenly he's reverting, yes, to like a, a lovesick teenager. He's like a 32 year old man. And like, uh, he's like, yeah, well, I love her again. <laughs> That's what it was though. <laughs> you know, having said that, I mean, I mean the whole arc and you know, this is true. I mean, the whole arc of the story changes with Marlon Brando in part two, as opposed to the mom, yeah. because it's a consistent, narrative you know if you watch part one i mean he i mean you know there's no secret right that some of what's going on in especially the way they built the first superman film is that they were paralleling superman and it's an obvious parallel to the mm. christ narrative right you know you're sent here by a godlike figure to mm. come and you know there are great people kal-el uh, they uh, and they they can be great, but they only lack the light to show the way. You're that light, you know what I mean? You're you're here. You're on a messianic mission for these people, and rather like the Martin Scorsese film from the Nikos Kazantzakis book, The Last Temptation of Christ. What would be the temptation of anybody so burdened? It would be like, why do I got to give my entire life up? You know, and anything that I might want to shepherd the people. Like maybe I just want to live like a regular human being for yeah. once. You know, and so it's all this like, you know, Christology kind of um, religious allegory narrative. Uh, and it pays off with Marlon Brando there in part two because it's the temptation of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? It's the, like, you know, Father, please take this cup away from me. You know, it's that whole concept. When you switch it out for the mother, I mean, that could be done well. I don't think it's done especially well, for one thing. And for another thing, it doesn't resonate with anything that came in the previous film. So, it, And, of course, they weren't planning on that. So, whatever. It just doesn't quite work for me. Not, uh, not once you see the way. It worked fine when I didn't know. Now yeah. that I know, it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think what it was for me, it was, it was a more logical path for him to go into this this crystal and then have his powers taken away in this thing, as opposed to this like light show that happens and he loses his power um, with, you know, him interacting with his father. And the only thing I would say that probably made it okay was the fact that if you talk about, listen, I want to spend the rest of my life with this woman, you're probably not going to talk to your dad about it. You're probably going to talk to your mother about it. If we're, yeah. we're being consistent in that regard, but that's we're we're picking, we're, we're sort of, you know, picking hairs here because I, for me, and this is something maybe, and I didn't know, this is what I wanted to ask you about. Yeah, but if you have that it, relationship, think about this stuff. If you have that relationship where you're like, gee, I want this. I know I better not go ask dad. I'll ask mom. 
what's mom going to say? Well, I'll talk to your father. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> this is a modern, modern <laughs> film in that regard. <laughs> Women are very powerful here. But the, 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 um, I think that sets up more obviously, and this is something maybe I missed, and this is what I wasn't sure about. When he does the switcheroo on the old crystal, uh, the crystal cave thing, when he retains his power and Zod loses his power. How is that explained in the Donner version? Because it's set up by him losing his powers in the Lester version. Well, it's the same explanation that he somehow reversed the chamber so that the chamber becomes... Was he in the chamber the in the Donner one? Yeah, I mean... Or was he a, just standing there and, and it was a big light show and all no, of a sudden... There, no, there's some kind of like little... It's not as obvious of a chamber, I grant you. Like They, mm. they refilm that to make the chamber look very, very obvious. Mm. Which is fine. I mean, I think that it's a little bit more subtle, but he's in some kind of partitioned off area, for lack of a better term. Um, so, so why don't we, uh, as, as time's getting on here, why don't we shuttle along to the to the end of the film? Because this is something that you did want to address. And for me, um, I, I think just to, I'm going to be very succinct with my view. The whole... I can live with the kiss because that scene, actually, if you look at that scene, oh, I was not, I wasn't there yet. I was going to okay. talk about the, uh, the ending sequence, which is problematic in both versions. It doesn't once again, it, but you know, Superman, so they have the big fight in Metropolis and mm. it's roughly the same in both films, you know, there's yeah. some small differences. I think the, the Donner one has better fight scenes than the Lester one. I'll grant it that. Well, Lester one's filled with these little, jokes that they're cut out of the Donner one, which I think, again, yeah. is an improvement. Because, again, if you want Zod and these folks to be taken seriously, you know, there's, like, I think the quintessential Lester joke is that they're blowing, you know, as the Metropolis mm. think that uh, Superman's been killed, so they... It's almost kind of poignant. They know that they are... That these people are not people that they that anybody can just go up and fight and expect to yeah. win. And yet, there's this kind of, like... Look, this this was our guy that you did this to, and there's a kind of poignancy to the notion that we we'll, we might lose, but we're going to try. We're as many of us as can do this and get together, grab anything you can. We're going to go after these people. Yeah. And then Zod just sort of you know with this kind of uh, a plum like bored almost. I'm not even going to touch you. I'm just going to, and yeah. that's all very poignant. And then it's sort of undermined by, like, in the Lester version, there's all kinds of, like, little gags about people's wigs blowing off and the yeah, one guy's on falling the phone. down reading a paper. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, okay, I mean, like, that's funny enough I think that's in, in one context, yeah. but it, it kind of, like, it, it depends. Or you want this to be serious or do you want this just to be sort of a ha ha ha? And well, then at they this go point up, in they, the film, it's not the they, right time. It's not. And then they go back up to, you know, so Superman realizes he's got to draw them out of Metropolis because this is the problem, which is smart, right? And I credit the film, either version, for he never says it out loud. He never says, like, I think in a modern film, you have to have him say or have a, a voiceover or some kind of thing where someone would say, oh, I see why he went up to the Fortress of Solitude to draw them away from. Yeah, yeah. But you just have to put that together as the audience. I, like I think both films. That's that's quite clever. I I, I right. realize when I watched that again, I thought that that's for a superhero film. That was a really good way to wrap up that fight with the bad guys. I thought it was right. really well done. And so then they get up there, and then of course there's a bunch of stuff that they re. And I think this was again just done. There's no reason to re-record what was done at the end of the Donner film. You could just have rolled with it. But I think this has must had had to do either with Lester's preferences, or just the fact that they needed to get a certain amount of the percentage of the film be directed by Lester. They in the Lester version, Lex Luthor is dropped off because they he didn't Gene Hackman didn't come back. So you see him only from behind. If you listen carefully, you can tell it's clearly not it's actually yeah, yeah. yeah right yeah. and then they have a fight amongst themselves and it's this thing where like they are standing here and they disappear and they appear over there and superman's standing here and he disappears and at one point he says to lois you know we used to play this game in school all the time i never was any good at it which is kind of funny you know in a sort of like just a, a, a non sequitur sort of thing but on the other hand what the hell is he talking about 
Mm. He clearly didn't play that in any school he went to on Earth, and Krypton blew up when he was a baby, where he never went to school. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like what, like what on Earth? It is, it is you talked about at the front end of this internal logic? Those are the kinds of things that I think people get annoyed with Richard Lester about. He was more interested in telling his little gags than he was at about the internal consistency of the character or the story, which I don't think he took seriously. I think he looked at it as this is just kids' comic books, so who cares? And that was definitely not the Richard Donner approach. Love it or this, love it or hate it. He came out of this like I. Yes, this is kids material, but this is stuff. I'm an American. He's a you know at the time he uh, he's going to be ninety, but in 1970 he was forty. So like a lot of kids, he was born 1930. He probably grew up reading Superman comics, mm. and so. On the one hand, he could probably recognized like a lot of forty year olds at the time. Sure, this is childish it's stuff I did as a kid, but it's still part of like I take it seriously on some level because Superman is the hero we all want to be. I mean, what Superman basically at the bottom line is is the notion that any one of us running around, we all have our weaknesses, our failings. The girl that we want doesn't like us. The you know the the bully beats us up at school, and, and it's the imagination that every kid has. If only they knew, like you know, I may look like this dweeb or whatever. But in reality, I'm Superman, right? Mm -hmm. And he took that whole element seriously, start to finish, and he wanted to take it seriously, start to finish. And I think that's why fans prefer, and I think correctly, the Richard Donner. I, I don't concept. think there's that much of a drop off between those two and that element, really. I, do, I really don't. And and I I can see that there's those those few little picadillos in the film, but I I I can pick a quite a few with the Donner version that maybe don't necessarily represent the brand of Superman. Oh, now I I think I think you make a good point that I think Donner has a lot more um, I don't know buy into the franchise as a filmmaker. But I, I, there's there's some after watching this I think there is logic but behind having somebody who's making a more serious film. And when I say serious film, I don't mean necessarily serious. Who you know it almost adds a bit of credibility to the franchise for not just fans of the film but fans of film. And and I think Lester brings a bit of balance to the franchise, and it left me wondering because it, the end scenes. When we look at those end scenes, it the the, the backward in time thing, the fact that Donner, if so, if I was Donner, um, and we were re-releasing this film, I would be embarrassed to play the oh I'm going to use the backwards in time thing again. I would be embarrassed to 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 use that. I think it was and, the biggest mistake. But it's but it's they did. It, it to me it's it's. I, I'm just amazed that that was the way it went forward. And even if I were to break down that scene where the kiss was stupid, but there's a lot of things that, that you know, and we didn't even talk about the cellophane S. That was just ridiculous in itself. And that oh, was that's very much a Richard Lester gag. Yeah, yeah, it is a list. And, and that that is a mistake. But I think the cellophane S is a lot less uh, uh, offensive than the, the time reversal piece. It's just, it's why doesn't Superman just do that every time? It just bothers me. But even if you look at that last scene where he does that kiss um, and you, the acting between Christopher Reeve and Lois Lane or sorry, Christopher, Christopher Reeve and Margot Kidder, it's, it's actually very good. The acting and some of the dialogue isn't that bad. If you just suspend your your sort of Superman franchise views, it's not right. a bad scene. So so for me, like I was left wondering. I wonder what Superman one would have been had it been directed by Richard Lester. Cause I think had he had time and he had the spec, I, I reckon, I think he might've done a better, this is going to be very controversial in Superman circles. I don't give a fuck. I think Superman one would have potentially been better with Lester. Wow. I, I don't think I can follow you there, Sean. I mean, no, no, Superman, no. I'm throwing myself into the cauldron. That's my Listen, view. I'm going to hold Richard you. Lester had his shot to do a full Superman movie start to finish. And it was Superman three. And he turned it into a Richard Pryor movie. And Superman 3 is very interesting in its own right because it's a slice of 1983. You know, Richard Pryor is at the absolute apex of his Richard Pryorness. And it, it and, and Richard Lester having, you know, Superman 2 was a big financial success. The Salkins looked at him as basically the savior because he came in, got it done, got it done under budget, you know, all the businessy things that you'd be worried mm. about, right? So then they gave him the reins, like, here, do Superman 3. And he came and he did Superman 3. And Superman 3, I mean, we could do a show about that movie sometime because it's, uh, you know, it's a fascinating movie. It really is. I could watch it Many, many times I have. I went for a period when I was, you know, I watched it a bunch when I was a kid, and then I didn't for many years. And I remember one time I was like, I, I think I got it. 
at Hollywood Video when they were going out of business. I bought their VHS set for yes. And I said, and I was dating my wife at the time. I was like, hey, let's go back to my house and watch the Superman 3. I, I seem to remember it was sort of a goofy kind of thing. And then for the first hour or so, I'm like, well, this movie's not so bad. It's pretty good, actually. You know, like it's not. It's got some silliness to it, but it's not overly so. It's it seems uh, pretty good, mm. and then it just kind of it doesn't really hang together much in the back half. But anyway, it's a very different. It's an extremely different uh, take on the character, and you see what Richard Lester, where he is, and what he would have done. Yeah, the first Superman film I think is about as good uh, to this day. I think it's the best superhero film ever done. I, I don't agree. Cap- with that. I, yeah, so here, my, I think my issue I with Superman. Is, so my issue with the first one is, and I, I like the film. I'm not saying I don't like the film. I very much do like the film. And before I went into two, I would have said I liked one before two. Before we watch this again, because I hadn't watched two in a long time. But but I think the problem with one, and and maybe it stems to my aversion to time travel, Superman. But it's it's the fact that he's fighting. You know this this natural uh, series of events with fault lines and earthquakes. And, you know, he's he's doing these things that, like, I just, I don't feel like they flow well or they, they you know, they're, it's almost too hard to suspend. Like, he's got these powers and the speed that he's moving and the way he's moving from one conflict to another. And they're focusing on just the ones that he's addressing. It just, I don't know, it just doesn't feel like a very smooth series of events that, that to me, like, I just have a lot of questions as far as what's going on. And then all of a sudden he goes back in time and they're all fixed. Well, see, I think the, the one mistake that they made was having Lois Lane die at the end of that film. Yeah. So that he then had to turn back the clock. Cause then that undoes a lot of the logic of the film. And again, I did not learn. No. And I did not learn until we were doing this, that that was not supposed to be the ending of Superman one. It was supposed Which to I be the know. ending of soup. It was supposed to be the ending of Superman two. Lois is supposed to dot was suppo- originally conceived to be killed by the bad guys at the end of Superman two. I don't like the whole, I mean, I agree. It's the weakest story element, no matter where you stick it, no matter how you think of it. I mean, I understand why they were enamored of, because what I I will say this about the Richard Donner cut, the interesting thing, if there is an interesting thing about turning the world backwards, was seeing on the ground things like what it looked like to be on the ground as the world went backwards, not from the point of view of just running film backwards of a dam busting, mm-hmm. but like of watching Perry White, you know, his toothpaste go back in the tube. Oh, yeah. I, I, the, I, the thing that jumped out of me at that scene is he's brushing his teeth with a cigar in his mouth. Yes. He's actually yeah. got a cigar in his mouth and he's like about to, he doesn't take it out at any point. No, can, can well, I, yeah. Talking about, and before we wrap up here, there's one inconsistently. Yeah. I wanted to get one inconsistency. I've always wanted to share this with somebody yeah. in Superman one. And it's something that okay. always bothered me. And it was um, my favorite thing and least favorite thing in the first film. And that is uh, the hideout for Lex Luthor. So that that underground next to the subway hideout that he has. That yeah, it's, elaborate a closed, setup. it's a closed train station. Yeah, I think that's a cool idea. I just remember, I can't get out of my head, the amount of contractors he had to get involved on that thing to get that place looking the standard it was and keep it a secret. (laughs) Yeah, no, it is It is is like (laughs) opulent. It is killer. And he found a way to, I mean, he's like Sleuther, of course, he can do that. But he found a way to do that without spilling the beans that it was there. It's really, really silly, but uh, if you think like about it, it at all. But no, it's a really cool – because I think what it was based on was like Grand Central Station and Penn Station, right? Yeah. Those were train stations because they were cl- – like Penn Station – What like Grand, I'm trying to remember. I learned about this in college. I believe it was Grand Central Station in New York that they closed – and they closed it so they could like sublimate it. Like they ended up running it underground. And so like, it, you know, they took away, it had originally been built as this big, beautiful, opulent thing and da da da. And they wound up turning into like this 70s sort of like dark underground train station with ceiling tiles and, you know, mm. kind of ugly and hideous. And then at some point they got the money together in New York to rehabilitate the real Grand Central Station. And there was like a similar thing to do with like New York Penn Station. They were going to buy the post office across the street because that building had been built this, at the same time. The original Penn Station building had been destroyed. It, anyway, I think that that's what it was the 70s at like the nadir. I mean, that movie came out in 78, and that was like the absolute nadir for 
cities in America, you know, like in the 1970s, cities were bad. And I think that they were kind of playing on the notion that like, you know, there was at one time this beautiful Grand Central yeah. station and that, you know, Lex Luthor is occupying. I will say one other thing about you. You mentioned that what you found tough about the first Superman film. And I think that's why Lex Luthor is, in fact, the perfect villain for Superman. And it's always the problem if you're having to write Superman, right, is that he... You know, you need a conflict, but he's like this all-powerful god. Yeah. And so how do you write? It's a real challenge for a writer. But, like, in the 90s, one thing that they did, like, the 70s, I'm not exactly sure how he, Lex Luthor was being portrayed in the comic books. They did what they did in the film, which is Gene Hackman puts in a, a very memorable performance. Um in the 90s, in, and specifically, you remember that there was Batman the Animated Series, then they did a mm. Superman the Animated Series cartoon. For that Superman the Animated Series cartoon, I think they were taking this from the comic book, they really kind of reconfigured the Lex Luthor character to be basically like the CEO of a multinational corporation. Yeah. And that's exactly what you said at the beginning of this, that he can't punch his way out. That's exactly what makes the conflict, is that you 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 present, here's a hero who can punch his way through, out, and out of, and into any physical situation you can name, but you put him up against an adversary who cannot be fought that way. That's interesting, you yeah. know what I mean? And I think that that is why Lex Luthor works. I, I, and I would say that that's what makes Superman one uh, is Lex Luthor. It's it's a very plausible strategy he's come up against this godlike character to take on. Right. And and where I think Superman one is let down is it's got this tremendous build up and this really clever way of taking out Superman and mitigating his powers, and then the series of events that happens from the point that Miss Tessmacher takes off the the kryptonite off of the necklace that he's drowning in from that point to the end, it, it kind of like, like, I always feel like I could probably, you know, I don't, I can not, you know, not pause the film and just come back to it whenever I don't feel like I'm, you know, Jimmy's at the Hoover dam and Lois yeah, is driving. Yeah. And I'm just sort of like, and that for me is why that's why I started to think that I think two is better because I, I get enjoyment throughout two. Whereas yeah. one, the, the end is just really sort of like a bunch of shit happens and he goes back in time and, and, like it's yeah. not gratifying to watch him, um, you know, push a fault line back up. It's just like there's a lot of things that I have to sort of put together yeah. in my head in the past to. The ending is the weak part. I think they would have been better off if he just saved Lois just in time. Because I mean, the idea that Superman could defeat an earthquake is kind of interesting. You know, I, I'm not as offended by that, <laughs> but uh, that Superman. I'm by it. I have to do a lot of work internally to like, like, just enjoy the film. You know, just yeah, to kind of get through that piece. I mean, it is the week. It is unfortunate that the Superman kind of the the last twenty thirty minutes are not the best twenty thirty minutes in that film. But um, yeah, well, at any rate, I, I still think though that the and the other thing is like you want to talk about ridiculous plot holes. <laughs> like what Lex Luthor is going to blow off you know, the existing coast of California because he's purchased this desert land and he's going to have the new coast and no one's going to notice that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not only that it's it's how he, my wife my, my wife is in a superhero film fan and we watched superman right. one about three months ago sure and she was taken back by how easy it was to get access to a nuclear weapon in america with uh, you know very you know otis was able to get in otis was able to well get i think to, that's a that's that's a thing of the period though it was a coming you yeah. remember Today we don't care about nuclear weapons anymore. It's not, not. I mean, I guess they're still a threat, but they're not at the front of our minds. This is, you know, written for a group of people who had to do like the duck under your desk drill because if you duck under your wooden desk when the nuke hits, you'll be fine. You're fine. <laughs> right. And no. uh, the idea, though, that yes, like a bumbling fool like Otis, like that's all it takes is you know somebody you know Lex Luthor pretending to have a Texas accent while like Otis runs in and like you know fiddles with the controls and whoop you do you have a nuclear accident. That's very much of the period. I mean, that's the yeah. same period when the China Syndrome came out, right? Like, and that stars. That's not Gene Hackman. That he's in the whatever the other one, but yeah, um, I, I think that that has to do with the. It's all of its moment. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's been, I got to say, I really enjoyed this conversation today. I think, I, I think here's where I think we sit with this and yes. this is my prediction. So hmm. I'm going to put it on the screen. What I think the verdict is Donner versus Lester. And I think we have to take our separate opinions uh, in order here. I think it's a, it's a draw 
really, because I'm heavily leaning towards Lester. I think you're heavily leaning towards Donner. I, mean, I don't think hard. we've come up I, with I a clear-cut say- outcome. I mean, we've said it before, but it is, it's a little bit of an unfair situation because <clears throat> the completed film Superman 2 is an enjoyable film. There's nothing wrong with it. I, I like yeah. it. I've watched it many times. And I'm comparing it against something that's more like a, a sketch, a draft, uh, you mm. know, uh, a what if, really. Something that can never be quite completed. And, you know, one is a done product and the other is not. But if I'm judging based on where do I think... Superman 2 would have gone under the direction of Richard Donner versus oh, yeah, the Richard, Donner. Richard Lester. Yeah. I, I have to probably say that I liked I what what it boils down to, I'm a Superman fan. And I appreciate that Donner and his team were taking the character and what they were trying to do with it somewhat seriously. And I think that if you you know, it's easy to look at what Superman 2 is and say, well, so is Lester. But remember, he's using a lot of material that already existed. When he had a chance to film from scratch, you get Superman 3. And in Superman 3, it's very clearly clear that he's not taking it all that seriously. Mm. And I think that... <laughs> you back? Uh, am I? Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. How much? I think we just cut out. For? Uh, we, we lost you. I, I, I think you said I think that, and then it cut out. Well, I just said I think with that in mind that the Donner version. Did you hear me saying about how the Donner version? He and his team were taking it more seriously than Lester was taking it. We got a glimpse, <clears throat> if you're curious, of what Lester would do, given full control with Superman in Superman 3. And from Superman 3, it's very clear that Lester didn't take the material that seriously. And as a Superman fan, <clears throat> I prefer an approach. It's still a comic book movie. You still have to have a light touch. But I do appreciate that they were trying to bring some level of gravitas to the, the material. And so... <laughs> for that reason i must i must side with the donner vision well i i think i think we uh leave it there because I, I don't think there's something we're going to agree on I, I think you sold me on quite a few points um it hasn't changed my view and to every superman fanboy who's going to give me shit about this i've watched a lot of your videos and i just i'm sorry that's my opinion you can love it or hate it eh. come back hey, the next the time real- the world is uh, differing opinions are what make the world go round, right? That's right. And this would have been a, we always, yeah, this would have been a boring chat had we agreed, I think, on uh, – it wouldn't have been boring, but I think this made it that much more interesting. So to everybody absolutely. who's tuned in, thank you so much for joining. This is our second show, and uh, please do like and subscribe, uh, and we will be back on next week. We uh, broadcast these every Friday. Uh, so, again, Fridays you will see our show. So please jump on again, and thank you for uh, joining in. Take care, everybody.